guys. So Miss Perna and Mrs. Demosis and I were talking and we were talking about how close we were to finishing The Boy Who Harnesses the Wind. We only had two chapters left. Um, and we decided that it would be really good to kind of finish it together. So I know it might be a little bit harder to focus and pay attention when you don't have the book in front of you because you're used to having the book in front of you. Um, but I think that if you settle in, maybe put in some earphones if you have them and really focus, maybe even close your eyes and just kind of listen as you're following along, I think that the last two chapters can still be really meaningful to you. So this is what we're gonna do. Because you don't have the book in front of you, and you don't have the book to go back to when you're answering questions. Two things are gonna be different than when we did it in class. The first thing is that the part where I'm reading is going to be shorter because we want you to be able to remember what you just heard so that you can go into Google Classroom and answer some questions. The second thing that's gonna be different um, is that I'm gonna kinda of give you a heads up if I just read something that there might be a question about. So that way you can extra pay attention and extra listen. Um, and that's again, because you don't have the book in front of you to look back at. Um, so I just wanna remind you that we last were together for chapter 13, um, where his windmill was successful, but then there was another drought and another famine. At that point, he and the people in his village got really discouraged. Um, and in fact, they were blaming the windmill for chasing away the, the storm clouds. That was kind of important because that kind of made William realize that they didn't really truly understand science. They still really relied a lot of their belief on magic um, and, and thinking about things like that. So he did really well for himself, but he's still kind of struggling. He still never finished school. He never got to go back to school. Um, so, you know, his problems aren't all fixed just because the windmill was successful. So we're going to go into chapter 14 today. It's called The World Discovers Wombe. Despite the incident with the famine, my popularity as an inventor led to other opportunities. That same year, one of the teachers at Wombe Primary asked if I'd be interested in starting a science club for the students. He was impressed by my windmill and wanted one on campus. The students look up to you, he said. Your skills in science will really challenge their brains. Sure, I said, I'll do it. The windmill I created for the school was small, much like my first radio experiment. For the blades, I used a metal maze pail and the generator was a radio motor. I attached it to a blue gum pole and ran the wires into my old Panasonic two battery radio. I did this during recess one morning when all the kids were playing soccer. When I connected the wires, there the music blasted through the schoolyard and a small riot erupted from all the excitement. The windmill not only allowed students to listen to music and news, but they could also charge their parents' mobile phones. Each Monday, I explained to them the basics of science and gave some popular examples of simple innovation, like how ink was first made by using charcoal. I also demonstrated the cup and string experiment featured in my books to help explain how a telephone works. I walked them through the steps of how I'd built everything using everyday materials. So many things around you are reusable, I told them. Where others see garbage, I see opportunity. I hoped I was inspiring them in some way because if I could teach my neighbors how to build windmills, I thought, what else could we build together? In science, we invent and create, I continued. We make new things that can benefit our situation. If we can all invent something to make our lives better, we can change Malawi. So we're gonna pause for a second. That means that there might be a question about this where he says, where others see garbage, I see opportunity. Why do you think he said that? What does he do with garbage that so many other people, especially in the USA, do with garbage, right? Get rid of it but he finds a way to repurpose it and reuse it. I later found out that some students, some of the students had been so inspired by the windmill, they'd gone home and made toy versions themselves. I imagined what it would be like if all those pinwheels were real. What if every home and shop in Wambe had machines on the rooftops to catch the wind? At night, the entire valley would sparkle like a clear sky full of stars. Bringing electricity to my people no longer seemed like a madman's dream. We're going to meet a new character now, so pay attention. He's kind of important. 
In early November 2006, some officials from the Malawi Teacher Training Academy were inspecting the library at Wambe Primary when they noticed my windmill in the schoolyard. They asked Ms. Sakelo who'd built it, and she gave them my name. One of them telephoned his boss, Dr. Hartford McKazim, and described what he had seen. A few days later, Dr. McKazim drove five hours to Wambe. He was even more amazed once he saw the larger windmill at my house, and he asked my father if he could speak with the boy who built it. He's here, my father said, and called me from his room. Dr. McKazim was an older man with gray hair and kind, patient eyes. But when he spoke, his command of language was large and powerful. I'd never heard anyone speak such good Chichua, and when he spoke English, it was simply eloquent. What was he most impressed with about Dr. McKazim? Might be a question. He asked me about the windmill and how it came about. Tell me everything, he said. I told the story as I'd done 100 times before, then took him through the house demonstrating how my switches and the circuit breaker worked. He listened carefully, nodding his head, and asked specific questions. These are very tiny bulbs. Why aren't you using big ones? I can use big ones, I said, but big lights require more voltage. The dynamo is only so strong. How far did you go with your education? Just the first year of secondary school. Then how did you know this stuff about voltage and power? I've been borrowing books from the library. Who teaches you this stuff? Who helps you? No one, I said. I've been reading and doing it alone. Dr. McKazium then went to see my parents. You have lights in your house because of your son, he said. What do you think of this? We thought he was mad, my mother said. Dr. McKazium laughed and shook his head. I want to tell you something, he said. You may not realize, but your son has done an amazing thing, and this is only the beginning. You're going to see a lot more people coming here to see William Kamkwamba. I have a feeling this boy will go far. I want you to be ready. The visit left me a little confused and very excited. No one had ever asked me such questions before and no one had taken that kind of interest. That afternoon, Dr. McKazim returned to his office in Zamba and told his colleagues what he'd seen. This is fantastic, they said. The whole world needs to know about this boy. I agree, said Dr. McKazim, and I have just the idea. The next week, Dr. McKazim returned to my house with a journalist from Radio One. It was the famous Everson Masaya, whose voice I'd heard for years. He'd come to my house to interview me. So what did Dr. McKazim do to get more attention? He arranged for him to be on a radio interview. What do you call this thing, he asked. I'm calling it electric wind. But how does it work? The blades spin and generate power from a dynamo. And in the future, what do you want to do with this? I want to reach every village in Malawi so people can have lights and water. While we waited for the Radio One interview to air, Dr. McKazim came with even more reporters. These men represented all the great media organizations in Malawi, Mudzuwitu and Zodiac radio channels, the Daily Times, the Nation, and Malawi News. They poured out of the car with their cameras and tape recorders and flocked around the windmill. For two hours, they moved through the house, elbowing and shoving one another to get the best pictures of my switches and battery system. You've had your time, now it's my turn. Move aside, my paper is bigger. Soon our yard was filled with crowds from the trading center who'd come to gawk at the famous journalists. Look, it's Noel Makubwi from Zodiac, they said. Finally, we see his face, what a handsome man, and he's interviewing William. One of the reporters even climbed my tower and studied the blades and chain system, taking pictures the whole time. McKazim, this chap is a genius, he shouted. Yes, he answered, and this is the problem with our system. We're losing talent like this all the time as a result of poverty. And when we do send them back to school, it's not a good education. I'm bringing you here because I want the world to see what this boy has done, and I want them to help. So that's another really important point. I'm going to read that line again. We're losing talent like this all the time as a result of poverty. So what does that mean? What is he saying? He's talking about how, you know, there's brilliant minds in Africa and in Malawi. And because they don't have enough money, they can't access their education. And because they can't access their education, they don't 
always reach their potential and become what they're capable of being, which means that they're losing talent and losing ideas. How many other people in Malawi could also have great ideas if they had access to good schooling? Luckily, William kind of fought his way ahead, even though he couldn't go to school to advance himself, but not everybody is able to do that. So that's an important part too. Like me, Dr. McKazian's father had also been a poor farmer who struggled to feed and clothe his family, but he knew the value of education. At one point when Dr. McKazian was young, he had volunteered to drop out of school and work so his brothers could go instead. His father refused saying, all my kids will stay in school. I'll do whatever it takes. It took nearly 10 years for Dr. McKazian to complete his secondary education. He later earned degrees from universities in Malawi, America, Britain, and South Africa. Before working with the MTTA, he'd written many Malawian textbooks, including my own Standard 8 English Reader. So that's where we're going to stop for today. Um, it was just a little bit of Chapter 14. Um, please go into Google Classroom and find the Google form and answer those questions. Have a great day.